Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Catholic Climate Covenant's webinar, Climate Changes Canaries, Oceans, and Vulnerable Populations. I'm delighted to have you all accompany us as we delve into the science behind how climate change affects oceans, how climate change impacts on oceans affects the vulnerable populations around the world. And we're going to hear directly from those who are already living with the impacts of climate change. I'm Paz Artasa Regan. I'm the program manager at Catholic Climate Covenant, and I'll be moderating this webinar. Please note that if you have a question or concern, you may write them in the chat box at the left-hand side. Uh, we'll choose questions written in the chat box for the Q&A segment. Um, try not to overwhelm the chat box with uh, conversations amongst you because it's going to be very hard for us to then find the questions. Um, the webinar is being recorded and we'll be sending you a link to the slides and to the recording. One other thing, uh, when you write your questions, it might also be good that if you have a specific presenter that the question is being aimed at, uh, write their person so that we know uh, who to ask it to. At this point, we're going to get started um, and we're going to start with a very short prayer just to center ourselves. So if you would join me in prayer for a couple of minutes here. Creator God, help us respond with wisdom to the threat of climate change. We pray for those affected by rising sea levels and extreme weather conditions. We pray for the health of the oceans that majestically proclaim your glory. Help us in reducing our own carbon footprint to play our part in reducing our nation's carbon emissions. Grant us the personal and political will to make a difference. Amen. To get started, please welcome Ryan Ono. Um, but be okay, hold on, let me switch here. Our main presenters are up here. We've got five people presenting. Uh, Ryan will go first, then followed by Sister Wendy, uh, then followed by the Livetti brothers who are in Australia, and finally Rosina Philippe. And I will be introducing each one of them right before they speak. Uh, the first speaker will be Ryan Ono, who will be helping us to understand the science behind how climate change impacts oceans. Ryan has served as the program coordinator of the Ocean Acidification Program at Ocean Conservancy since two th January 2014, where he collaborates with fishermen and shellfish growers to find policy solutions to address ocean acidification. He previously worked for five years in, to support sustainable fisheries management efforts in the Gulf of Mexico and the South Atlantic regions with Environmental Defense Fund. He holds a Master of Marine Policy from the University of Delaware where he studied shellfish aquaculture permitting uh, policies and a Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of California, Berkeley. Ryan has been an evangelical Christian for 15 years and serves as an advisor to Interfaith Oceans, a group serving to bridge faith and marine conservation groups while raising awareness and action to preserve the ocean. Uh, Ryan, uh, if you would unmute yourself. Your line is now unmuted. All right. Can you hear me? I can hear, I can you. hear you. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you so much, Paz, for that introduction. Um, I will go ahead and get started then. Let me find the right button. Okay. So what I'll do is just do a brief um, introduction to the science of and how the global climate interacts with the ocean. And then I'll start delving a little bit more into the specifics of how carbon dioxide emissions and climate change alters that relationship. So first, just starting off without any sort of climate change, the Earth's climate is simply the result of the uneven distribution of the temperature at its surface, mainly between the poles and tropics. Eventually, this leads to winds and ocean currents, which carry heat from the equatorial regions to the poles over the course of seasons or years. Um, and the ocean plays a key role in absorbing heat and carbon and moves them both all around the earth. As the ocean helps to drive currents and winds around, these conditions help establish the habitats for humans and virtually all marine life. Um, I don't know if you could see my mouse, but you could just see this picture of the earth with the winds and the clouds swirling around. Um, and that's basically heat moving all around. So, 
Carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases are increasing temperatures and ocean acidification around the planet. And while much of this extra heat is absorbed by the ocean, that partially buffers us from the greenhouse effect. And so while that is good for us who folks who live on land, that has an impact for the creatures who live beneath the water. And um, so the, as you can see from the top of the slide, there are six impacts that I'll be describing in this presentation um, with regards to that increase in heat, such as shifting fish stocks, the bleaching of coral reefs, melting of polar ice caps, the rising sea levels, and deoxygenation of our ocean. And then I have ocean acidification as a separate point because it is separate from climate change. Both are driven by carbon dioxide emissions, but ocean acidification is actually a change in ocean chemistry. And I'll get a little bit more into the details of that um, further on. So much of the presentation will talk about the increase in ocean temperatures. And so for background, the global ocean temperature has risen by 1.3 degrees Fahrenheit or 0.74 degrees Celsius since the late 1800s. And the current rate of um, the current uh, the current increasing rate of greenhouse gas emissions, a temperature rise of up to seven degrees Fahrenheit or four degrees Celsius this century is a distinct possibility. And so while right here I have a static heat map of the earth, I wanted to show that fish stocks or fish populations are moving away from the equator towards the poles and more habitable temperatures. So this creates two immediate problems. There will be fewer and fewer fish that live in these warmest ocean waters near the equator, kind of where the red areas are in the middle of the map. And then as the stocks shift, they will create con that will create conflicts between the traditional stocks and newcomer stocks as they fight for space and for food. So fish in the northern hemisphere will move towards the North Pole. Fish in the southern hemisphere will tend to move towards the South Pole. Corals are also under stress uh, from a number of directions and temperature increase is a big one. The corals naturally live in symbiosis with algae where they provide the algae protection through a skeleton home. And while algae photosynthesize providing food and color to the corals and that's what makes them so colorful. Um, but unfortunately, coral bleaching is when the corals get stressed. This occurs oftentimes when water temperatures and, pol and or pollution levels rise and thus the algae separate from their homes, leaving just the white coral skeletons behind as shown here. This is disturbing, of course, when you consider that reefs cover 0.1% of the ocean floor, yet provide habitat for 25% of all marine fish species. Now, bleaching isn't always fatal, but that has been one of the main causes of coral death for the past 20 years. Bleaching events have become much, much more frequent and severe as temperatures have risen. Uh, for a more geographic specific case, unfortunately, the Great Barrier Reef uh, has been found in recent studies to um, be up to uh, have 93% of it lost, experienced, I'm sorry, experiencing some level of bleaching and notable amounts of it are either dead or dying. Warming is also warming in the atmosphere and ocean waters is melting the polar ice caps as well, unfortunately. And our, the Arctic Ocean is warming at twice the global average. It's set to increase by 12.6 degrees Fahrenheit or seven degrees Celsius by 2100. And here I have pictured here the Arctic minimum sea, um, sorry, the sea ice covers from about the past 30, 35 years. And you can see it's decreasing. And although the, the um, shrinking Arctic ice cap will not increase, well, sorry, will not contribute to another issue of sea level rise. The melting of ice over Antarctica in particular will contribute to that because it's ice on land. Uh, to get a little bit more at sea level rise and its impacts, here's a, a projected map or um, some projections of what the Southeast US will look like with, get, with certain amounts of sea level rise. I don't know if you can tell from the writing, it's a little bit small on the screen, but on the top left panel is a one meter sea level rise estimate. Uh, top right is two meter rise. Bottom left is a four meter rise and bottom right hand panel is an eight meter rise in the sea. And the red areas, the red color indicates areas of land that would be underwater with that sea level rise. Um, and unfortunately, um, 
unfortunately, Miami and, and New Orleans are, are definitely going to be impacted. Um, but just for a little bit of context, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency has estimated that sea level has risen six to eight inches around the globe in the last 100 years. And the global mean sea level rise may approach approximately one foot by mid-century and 2.5 to 6.2 feet by the end of the century. So that look a little bit somewhere in between the top two panels um, by 2100. Another impact of global warming is that um, there is a loss of oxygen. Warmer waters just simply hold less oxygen and in coastal areas that could cause fish and shellfish and crustacean species to suffocate and die. And in certain very bad cases, you get some these fish kills like this one here in the, I believe it's Redondo Beach, California, near my hometown of Los Angeles, where just a confluence of events depleted the oxygen in the area and all of these fish, I believe they're anchovies, and they just died in this harbor area. Um, and so in certain um, coastal areas, this is a problem. I, I believe that I'm sure that some of the folks from the Gulf of Mexico will probably talk a little bit about this sort of thing later. And so moving a bit away from ocean temperatures and climate change, I'd like to talk a little bit for a moment about ocean acidification. Um, as I said earlier, the ocean absorbs a lot of carbon from the atmosphere, and that's good. Approximately 25% of the CO2, of all CO2 generated by human activity since the mid 1700s has been absorbed by the oceans. However, that's caused an increase of, an increase of ocean acidity by 30% and it's expected to increase by 100 to 150 percent by 2100. And so this change in ocean chemistry, this ocean acidification makes it harder for reef building and reef associated organisms like corals and oysters to grow and develop and provide all of those ecosystem services and um, great things. Pictured here is a sea snail or pteropod whose shell has been shown to diminish in the wild as a result of prolonged exposure to acidic conditions. And these sea snails are a key microscopic species in the food chain, particularly off the U.S. West Coast. So that doesn't bode well for um, larger fishes that um, people oftentimes fish for or that larger fish eat. Um, so I know that I just went through a lot of material and impacts of climate change and ocean acidification, um, but I believe we'll be having questions towards the end of the whole presentation. So if you have any, please feel free to ask me then. Thank you, Thank Ryan. You, Ryan. Uh, if, uh, if Ryan, Ryan, Ryan Thanks. Uh, next, we are honored to hear from Sister Wendy Flannery. Um, Sister Wendy is a Sister of Mercy from Brisbane, Australia. She's been engaged in a range of educational development and social justice ministries in the Pacific Islands region. Uh, she holds a postgraduate degree from Catholic Theological Union and the University of Chicago. She first got involved in environmental concerns when she worked with the World Council of Churches program on justice, peace, and the integrity of creation. She helped establish an NGO presence at the UN for the Sisters of Mercy International, and it was during this time that she developed an awareness of the impacts of climate change on communities in the Pacific and other small island states. In 2003, she joined Friends of the Earth Australia to highlight the climate change concerns of people in the Pacific. And for the past six years, she's coordinated climate um, front lines, working uh, group in Friends of the Earth Brisbane. Uh, she carries the responsibility for awareness raising and advocacy in relation to the Pacific, and more recently has been building links with the indigenous communities in the Torres States Island, Strait Island, in the north of Australia, which is also facing serious climate change impacts. She, Sister Wendy is a member of the Earth Matters Interest Group connected to the Brisbane Archdiocese Catholic Justice and Peace Commission. I'd like to welcome Sister Wendy. Uh, if you could unmute your mic and start, please. Thank you very much, uh, Paz, and good to be with everybody. Uh, the place I'm actually sitting in is called Woolloongabba. Uh, it's an Aboriginal word meaning the place of whirling waters. And so I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of this place who lived here 
who celebrated life for thousands and thousands of years before uh, my ancestors arrived here a couple of hundred years ago. So we acknowledge them and express our respect to, for them and the way they looked after this place all those uh, centuries. Uh, so here's the, my topic, the challenges that uh, climate change impacts on the oceans present to vulnerable communities uh, in the Pacific. Um, because climate change is actually undermining the life supporting capacities of oceans and magnifying their destructive potential. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, share this map with you uh, and to just say that it's more that, than just the South Pacific that I'm talking about because the Pacific Islands region is now regarded as one region. So uh, the equator uh, goes through about the centre of the map. And so the countries in the north, so uh, the Palau, the Federated States of Micronesia, Northern Marianas, Guam, Marshall Islands, Nauru, Kiribati, and so on, they all belong to the South Pacific region and they have many links politically uh, through churches uh, and, and actually operate as a political entity in relation to the United Nations as well. So it's, it's better to refer to the Pacific Islands region. Um, uh, now, um, it's an amazing region of the world. Uh, it comprises 21 political entities. 13 of them are full participants in the Pacific Islands Forum, which is the main political uh, group that they gathered under. Uh, a, a big range of geophysical and ecological characteristics. Uh, if you look to the, to the western side of the map, north of Australia, uh, the country of Papua New Guinea has a very large land mass and between six and seven million people. And then you get many other smaller island states uh, and uh, territories uh, adjoining and going eastward. Um, all of these places are experiencing severe impacts of climate change. Now, um, some of those places, uh, and in particular, Tuvalu, Kiribati, uh, Marshall Islands, are comprised entirely of atolls. And so um, they are, uh, are facing total extinction, really, as nation states. Uh, I just want you uh, uh, to alert you to Tuvalu. If you look right in the centre of the map, you'll see Tuvalu. And it's from there that our two guests, Niveki and Sailoto, uh, who will be speaking later uh, in the webinar, they come from there. That's their place of origin, right in the centre of the map. Uh, this is just a, a, a starting picture to give you an idea of what's happening. Uh, you'll immediately be able to see the coconuts uh, there from sea level rise and extreme weather just uh, totally uprooted and washed into the ocean. This picture is from the Carteret Islands, uh, an atoll group off a large island in Papua New Guinea uh, where the people are already uh, being relocated. Okay, so uh, many of the things that are on this slide are things that Ryan already talked about. Uh, if you just uh, have a look at those, I won't go through them in detail, um, but uh, they're all globally relevant, but they're particularly relevant, every one of them, in the Pacific Islands region as well. Uh, I can, if you look at the one about sea level rise and the way that is linked with extreme weather events. Uh, I can remember when I was working uh, at the UN, uh, working with the ambassador from the Marshall Islands. Uh, people in the US, of course, will have heard of the Marshall Islands for many, many reasons. One, one being that that's where the US conducted its nuclear tests. But anyway, uh, the Marshall's ambassador joined us for a particular event and the thing that I still remember him saying was that uh, he had already experienced, and this was back in 2001, uh, before that, 
uh, the, the ocean washing right across the island. Uh, that would have been Majuro, the main island, right across the island, past his front door. So uh, it gave me a sense of the experience of vulnerability that, uh, that people are feeling. So a couple of slides just to illustrate uh, uh, what's happening. You can see the ocean coming right up to the shore there, right up to where the palm trees are planted and uh, not long before they all collapse into the ocean. And that's the situation in so many places in the Pacific. Uh, here, if, if you look to the uh, right on the slide, there's a seawall that has been built there to keep the ocean at bay, but you can see that it's already many, many metres out from, from the shoreline now and totally covered by the ocean. So many attempts that people have made to hold back the ocean have, have not succeeded. So sustainable livelihoods is the next area I'd like to focus on. And uh, those are some of the, uh, the impacts on sustainable livelihoods. Uh, you've heard Ryan talk about the migration of, of fish species. Uh, of course, the decline of food species from reefs. Um, uh, I can remember actually being in the Marshall Islands and talking with some women there and them saying to us, well, you people who live on land have your gardens, have your food gardens. But we, we ocean people, for us, the reef and the, um, uh, the lagoon that the reef creates, the, the onshore reef around our, our atolls, the reef is the equivalent of our, of our garden. That's where we get so many things that we depend on for our livelihood. So, uh, um, Yes, yeah, so, uh, and, and of course, um, the, uh, the crops that people grow, and especially the palms and other things from the reef as well, uh, not just a source of food, but a source of so many other things uh, in people's lives. Housing, uh, items of daily use like baskets, fish traps and mats, and then ceremonial items as well. Uh, those are all affected when, uh, when palm trees are lost and when uh, items from the reefs are lost. Um, Saltwater intrusion into ground, groundwater systems is a huge issue for people on atolls because there's a very shallow uh, freshwater lens below the surface and it's very, very easily contaminated. Uh, there's a, just a couple of examples here. That was from an extreme weather, weather event in Kiribati, one of those uh, central Pacific nations. Uh, those are the remnants of coconut palms. All that is left are the, the bare sticks. And you can see the sea lying all over the land there. Uh, this is a, a vegetable garden that, again, the sea has washed through. You can see the remnants of some uh, bananas, banana trees there. Uh, and uh, all the other crops that may have been grown in these places now uh, lost. Uh, human settlements and infrastructure is the next area to think about. Um, and uh, those are some of the things that, uh, that happen when, uh, with extreme weather events, with sea level rise, and in general, the impact of climate change. And you can imagine how much it takes to restore those with limited resources, um, uh, to restore the damage to all those, uh, the infrastructure and the, the facilities. Uh, here are a couple of slides to illustrate um, that situation. So you can see here, again, the ocean washing in. That's, that's seawater uh, inundating people's living spaces. Uh, I think that slide may come from Tuvalu, where uh, Livetti and Salotto come from. I'm not absolutely sure. Uh, and this one as well. Uh, you can see the, the depth of the seawater there that's washed in around people's houses. Um, and of course, you know, 
people's household goods and their personal possessions get destroyed as well. Uh, and it takes such a long time uh, to recover from those uh, extreme weather events. Uh, the other area that's impacted is culture and traditions. Um, uh, damage to coastal cemeteries, for example, inundation of sites of cultural and sacred significance, loss of cultural practices and knowledge, loss of homelands, and I'll come to that separately in a moment, uh, and, and the cultural factors involved in relocation. Um, uh, under the uh, area there of cultural practices and knowledge, I forgot to add skills. Uh, I can remember hearing uh, uh, about some of the people from the, the, the northern, north of the equator, but I'm sure it's true also of the Polynesian peoples, that um, they had a knowledge of the sea that was equivalent to modern radar, an absolutely extraordinary uh, understanding of how the, of the sea and how the currents work, the winds, uh, navigation by the stars, looking at birds and so on. So uh, all that knowledge is gradually being lost as well, uh, as well as the, the, the wonderful diversity of cultural practices uh, that people have developed uh, over millennia. Uh, these are a couple of slides. Now, I think that one was actually taken in the Marshall Islands. Uh, and you can see the cemetery there being inundated and graves being washed into the sea. Uh, all people in the Pacific have very close uh, uh, connections to their ancestors. Uh, as, as I think all indigenous peoples around the world do as well. Uh, very, very close connection um, and, and a sacred connection to their ancestors. Um, uh, uh, earlier last year, I was with uh, a group of people meeting in Fiji, uh, looking at projects of relocating people uh, as a result of climate change. And there was a woman there from Kiribati, one of the countries in the Central Pacific composed entirely of atolls. And their government, who knows that they will have to move very quickly, uh, actually within the next five to ten years, they're saying now. Um, the government purchased some land in Fiji, uh, which has much larger islands, and uh, it turned out that there was plantation land available for them to purchase. Well, the woman from Kiribati, from this atoll uh, country, looked across to the area where their government has purchased land and thought about what it would be for them to move there, and she said, Will we be able to take the bones of our ancestors with us? So that's how deep, uh, that illustrated for me how deeply that connection is for people uh, and, and the, the, those who have gone before. Um, and of course, uh, where do people move to? Now, this slide was taken, uh, is a picture I took in Fiji last year. Um, the Fiji government has estimated that somewhere between six and seven hundred communities in Fiji itself will have to move. Uh, so uh, they decided that they would do a pilot project. There was one community on, on the seashore that was just constantly being inundated and had lost one of their children during an extreme weather event, had lost one of their children to the sea. Uh, their houses were gradually being destroyed as well. So the government did a project to relocate them. Now, they were able to relocate to this area, uh, which was part of their traditional land, because all over the Pacific, uh, a large proportion of the land still is under customary ownership. So these people were able to move on their own land. Uh, the thing that struck me was the similarity of the houses. They were like little boxes. And it's not at all like a typical village in Fiji where you get a greater diversity of, of living structures and so on. 
So it had a bit of an artificial feel about it. But of course, um, so many people uh, have nowhere really to move to within their own territory, as it were. So the whole issue of where people will move to uh, is huge. Now, I put this one in because it does show uh, the kind of challenges that, that people are facing in the Pacific. Um, in 2014, they had the third meeting of Small Island Developing States, the third conference of Small Island Developing States, which is a group within the United Nations. And it was held in Samoa. And I happened to see somehow what they call the zero draft outcome document that the UN uh, that the, the uh, is originally put together for governments to then negotiate on and finally come to an outcome document agreed at the conference. Now, in the zero document, here's what it says. The international community needs to address the security implications of climate change, including violations of territorial integrity. And then it goes on to talk about forced displacement and preparing communities for relocation. Now, when that document finally got to the, to the, to the conference, that language was changed. The whole uh, indication about security implications and violations of territorial integrity had been taken out because it didn't suit the, the big power representatives that were going to be turning up to that meeting. They didn't want to see that language in there. But in fact, that's how the Pacific Island peoples themselves see what's happening to them, as a violation of territorial integrity. It's like another wave of colonialism. So uh, now I'm getting to the end of the presentation. Um, and uh, so uh, the question then is, uh, how people uh, will be able to re-establish or regain their sovereign identity if their entire nation has to move. Now, I put this one in. This uh, picture was taken in the Carteret Islands, an atoll group uh, in Papua New Guinea, we, we, which is already uh, being supported by uh, a relocation program. And uh, we're involved closely with that program. And the Catholic Climate Covenant actually showed a film about that program as part of their uh, education a couple of years ago. Uh, these are some of the women uh, at a session where their situation is being explained. Uh, the, the situation that they will have to move from their homeland. And I put that in because you can see reflected in the faces of the women uh, all the questions of uncertainty, of anxiety, of uh, resistance even to having to consider this for themselves and their families. Uh, so there are very, very emotional uh, issues involved for people uh, having to abandon their, their homelands. Uh, and this is the final slide. Uh, I thought. I found this very powerful when I first saw it, and I thought you might too. Now, it was taken in 2009 uh, in the Carteret Relocation Program area, and uh, they were commemorating Earth Day that evening, uh, the day when we switch off our lights, for, uh, Earth Hour, sorry, and um, one of the children was carrying that poster. Uh, of course, it, it has echoes of the gospel for us, uh, and they're saying we can't walk on water. So uh, I think um, that that says a lot. And thank you for listening, and happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you, Sister Wendy. We're going to be taking questions at the end of all our presentations. Uh, but if people have questions for Ryan or uh, Sister Wendy, uh, they can go ahead and start writing them um, on the chat box, and we'll be writing them down so that we can ask them. Uh, at this point, uh, to follow up uh, Sister Wendy's fantastic presentation, which I think really starts putting the human face to what many of us work on as a policy issue, uh, and I'm, you know, it's sometimes so important to really remember that 
all these policies impact uh, human beings. Uh, we're delighted to have at this point uh, two brothers, uh, Livetti Livetti and Siloto Livetti, and I hope I didn't uh, mispronounce your names. Uh, they're from Brisbane, Australia. Uh, they, in fact, from what Sister Wendy sent me your information, uh, Livetti, you're 21 years old, and Siloto, you're 19. So I'm very glad that we have uh, some very young people here. Uh, you're studying at the University of Australia, uh, in Australia. Your par the parents are both from Tuvalu and have migrated to Australia to seek a better life for the family. Uh, Tuvalu is on the front line of climate change, as you've heard. Uh, so they're feeling the consequences of climate change uh, already firsthand. Uh, the Livetti brothers are passionate about their country and continue to raise awareness regarding it whenever and wherever they can. Now, Livetti and Siloto, you're on the phone, so um, or are you on the computer? Uh, we're on the computer. Okay, so you see that I put up a couple of uh, photo, uh, photos there, um, and you're welcome now to start speaking. Awesome. So uh, my name is Levetti and my name is Siloto. And uh, pretty much today we're going to talk to you about our, our island home of Tuvalu. Um, first off, we're just going to give you an idea of where and what Tuvalu is. So Tuvalu is the fourth smallest country in the world. Uh, we've got a population of about 11,000 people. We're a very small country um, in terms of total area. We only have um, 26 square kilometers, which is very small in that you could probably walk from one side of the island to the other in probably 45 minutes and see all of it in its entirety. Um, so the word Tuvalu translates in English to eight islands standing together. And that's pretty much how we approach climate change. We approach climate change standing together and we continue to fight standing together. Um, research has shown that um, the sea level rises in Tuvalu one to two millimeters every year. Um, this is very alarming when our average elevation is not even two meters in Tuvalu and the highest peak in Tuvalu is just four meters. Um, when you take into consideration the storms, the high tides, king tides, floods and cyclones, um, yeah, we're, we're struggling to stand together. We have uh, two distinct seasons in Tuvalu, a dry season and a wet season. The wet season generally spans from November to April, and it is a time where we you know we have to brace ourselves. Within the wet season are the expected king tides, the highest of high tides, and they've become way more frequent in Tuvalu, with tides, with tides reaching more inbound every single year. The average distance that king tide travels is about 3.2 meters, which sadly compromises about half of Tuvalu's land area. Um, at these times, this is where we, uh, those who live in small huts have to flee to find shelter in more durable homes. Um, and our attempts at Sea walls made from stones and oil drums have not been successful in keeping these tides out. I want to share a quick story um, about um, one that my father taught us. Um, back when he was in his 20s, he and his brothers, cousins, friends would take a, the canoe out to a small island called the book was Sevilla Vili, and they would go tuna trolling. Uh, he says it's one of the highlights of his life, and it was a great getaway from work, school, and in general life. Uh, fast forward nine years to 2001 when we uh, returned to Tuvalu. Um, the book of Sevilla Vili was uh, no longer above water. It became submerged due to Cyclone Kelly in 1997. And uh, yeah, that very place where my father bonded with his brothers and cousins was gone. They were no longer, he said they were no longer able to canoe over the where the island once was. And that's just a illustration of how climate change has 
really acceptable. The effects of climate change has exerted an adverse impact throughout the overall lifestyle of Tuvalu. Our main sources of subsistence, agriculture and coral reef fisheries have been, I guess, compromised by different climate change factors. Our agricultural industry prides itself in the cultivation of natural endemic plant species such as bulaka, whilst also growing beautiful flora such as coconuts, breadfruits and more. However, the impact of average sea level rise and frequent flooding events has induced the chronic occurrence of saltwater intrusion. This has resulted in habitat conditions becoming too salty for our commonly grown plants to thrive appropriately. Also associated with saltwater intrusion is a reduction in drinkable water for our community to utilize. Exacerbated by increased frequencies of drought periods and natural disaster events such as tropical cyclones, Tuvalu has had to declare a state of emergency a couple of times, just based solely on water demands. We have had temporary desalination plants imported to Tuvalu from Australia and New Zealand, but even with those in use, we still are struggling to meet our daily household water needs. Not only are these um, in effect within Tuvalu, we have also had an adverse impact on our coral reef fisheries. Um, we, as a main source of import, our coral reef fisheries, we, um, most of our jobs and employment are within that industry. However, we've, due to ocean acidification and frequent coral bleaching events, um, the, the specific fish species that we um, harvest sustainably within Tuvalu has reduced and therefore our biodiversity has reduced and this has impacted negatively on our coral reef fisheries industry. I would also like to talk about our, um, the fact that with the in, in increasing sea level rise we've had a lot of incidents where um, groundwater has intruded within land and we have ended up with I guess you can say swamps in the middle of our islands. And this has also increased the risk of vector-borne diseases as well as waterborne diseases. So human health has definitely become a risky factor within Tuvalu. And also with the fact that our nat these natural disaster events, we have been in the pathway of them for quite some time, dating all the way back to 1972 with the tropical cyclone um, BB, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Um, these events have tremendously impacted and have, um, I guess, um, made such a severe influence onto our lands that we have to have people relocate. And the possibility of relocation is scary just because our Tuvalu is our home and it is our culture and it is our identity. With climate change refugees especially, we've, we've had some people relocate and have been identified as climate change refugees, especially um, translate, um, relocating ourselves to New Zealand. We have actually been deemed as climate change refugees there. And we'd also like to acknowledge our brothers and sisters throughout the Pacific Islands that have also unfortunately undergone the same process. But despite the fact that we have had all of these, I guess, um, adverse impacts on our land and on our community and on our country, we still have this fighting spirit to keep pushing on and to keep moving on, to keep advocating climate justice, we, yes, we are very small, and yes, we may be um, tiny in proportion to the rest of the world, but our voices are loud and proud. We are immersed with our culture every single day. It is so beautiful and so unique, and to see something so untouched, such as our culture, being impacted against and threatened against by the events of climate change, it gives us this passion 
to keep on fighting for our country and to keep um, being there and motivating our fellow Tuvaluans to be united at the forefront, to become climate change warriors and to continue to fight the good fight against climate change. We are standing together in solidarity against climate change and we will continue to. And we thank you for the opportunity for allowing us to speak here to all of you on behalf of Tuvalu. Yes, we are small, but with these opportunities, we are able to spread our voices and to spread the message that climate change is real. It is something that has gone for so for far too long for it to be ignored. So, thank, again, thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, you Livoti and Siloto. Very, very moving. Uh, because of the time, we're going to have to keep going. Uh, and we may end up being a little beyond the hour. I apologize to uh, everybody uh, if you can bear with us so that the questions can be also incorporated. Uh, at this point, we're going to change geographic locations and we're going to move to the Gulf Coast of the United States. Uh, it's a privilege to have Rosina Philippe uh, of the Plaquemines Parish Grand Bayou Village in Louisiana join us today. Uh, Rosina is descended from the Atacapa Ishak Shawasa tribe, who have inhabited local Louisiana far earlier than the European explorers arrived in the area. She's an advocate for preservation of traditional cultural practices, as well as the ecosystems that support them. Uh, her work focuses on racial justice, economic sustainability, and coastal restoration and preservation. Elder Philippe, uh, speaks frequently at universities and conferences nationwide and publishes accounts of the challenges her village faces. Uh, we're going to be hearing here a very similar story from what we heard from the Vati brothers. Um, Rosina, are you on? Yes, can you hear me? I can hear you, Hello? yes. Okay. I can hear you, Wonderful. yes, go ahead. All right, thank you very much for allowing me to be a part of the sharing and I'm, you know, listening to those who presented before me. I'm, um, you know, just overwhelmed um, of the similarities. Uh, even though we're miles and miles apart, you know, we see some of the same impacts and uh, the issues that we are facing. Now, my community in Grand Bayou, uh, we are on the coast, southeast coast of Louisiana. And my people have been in this region longer than anyone else. Uh, we are still only accessible by boat, and we are subsistent users um, of this environment. But we also see ourselves as having a symbiotic relationship with the life that surrounds us. Um, Climate change uh, impacts are real, and it's happening now. And as you heard the previous speakers, you know it's it's critical that we wake up and pay attention. And I, this is so appropriate the, the naming of this uh, gathering. We are dealing, you know, years ago when my people were out on the waters and in the land, you know, there were norms, seasonal norms that we pattern our lives after. You know, we were able to predict, you know, to able to be able to um, determine what course to take, you know, how things were going now with these extreme weather and uh, uh, that we're facing the extreme weather the patterns that are that we're facing. You know, everything has become so unpredictable. Our seasonal norms are no longer um, the pattern of you know life in in our life world is that they're static. Um, this is past winter. You know, we have fruit trees, and there was an unseasonable flowering of these trees when our winter became warm, you know, because it was not time for such, you know, warm temperatures. 
So they flowered out. And not long after, you know, winter resumed and all of these blossoms died. So that we have seen that our, our food producing trees are being uh stressed to where, you know, the, the life the life of the tree is not as um long as it used to be. And I think we have trees. We have trees in my village because we've had to find other ways to grow. We're having to use raised bed gardens, and those are containers like maybe four, four feet by four feet, you know, above the the uh, land, because our our no, the trees that were here before they're they're going because the land is no longer uh, able to sustain these different species because of the salt water that continues to cover the land and kill off all of these um, trees and plants that we had come to rely on for our lives. We, uh, we also see in the environment, we have to pay attention to the very little things. You know, when the storms come in to the region, you know, it's the big storm. And uh, there's a lot of coverage on that. But in our life world, where we're connected to this environment, uh, in ways that most people have forgotten, we have to pay attention to the little things, you know, the small pollinators, the, the things that make the larger things possible. And we are seeing with the loss of vegetation that the pollinators are going elsewhere. So when the blossoms are coming you know, they're no longer being uh, being able to produce any type of edible food. Um, we are seeing more water during uh, the storm events. You know, and there are layers of impacts, like with the Katrina Rita. You know, it's back to back two weeks. You know, so those we're seeing these extreme patterns. Where before, you know, the storm would come in and there was a period of recovery and, you know, but now it's like back to back, you know, and everything is, is so extreme. So the devastation continues to overwhelm, you know, the people here. Um, and as we see the uh, the environment degrade around us, we also see the loss of habitat and the species change, you know, our we are subsistent users of this time of the year is our, our shrimping. And um, the first week, you know, there, there was shrimp in the, in the waters. But now, you know, it almost seemed to have depleted so that there's, you know, the economy is heavily impacted. Our food supply um, is dwindling. So all of these things, because the water is so warm, and uh, the things that, you know, needed, you know, different temperatures, they're not able to, to spawn and, and to live in the changing uh, temperatures. We used to depend on a seasonal hunt here in my village uh, in order to supply food for our families and also uh, as an economic means uh, in, in the winter times uh, to get, you know, funds in order to um, take care of some other needs. But we have seen that with the increased temperatures that, you know, the, the hunt, the animals that, you know, we hunted are no longer here. They have moved away or they have died off. So, um, you know, that's a change that has heavily impacted us. Um, I know others have talked about how um, the, the salt water and the uh, the rising seas and the sinking land, all of these things um, have impacted, um, you know, their communities and their people. And we see the same thing here, you know, and it's important. It's very, very important that 
people take note of what's being said because until and unless, you know, um, we start to um, address these issues immediate in the immediate sense, you know, um, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what the future holds for a lot of communities. I know there's a lot of talk about um, resettlement and relocation. For my people, we are not looking. I mean, there are some that have to. There's, there's no choice. Um, but we are not looking to that as of yet. We are still willing to stand and hold this place, not just for ourselves, but for all of the other life forms that share this ecosystem. You know, and also we want to hold this place for our future generation. Um, we are looking, you know, as the land changes around us, as the temperatures change around us, the vegetation, everything, our life world is changing, and it's becoming less predictable. But we're having to increase our own timelines of change, where we're looking to explore um, new ways of living with this imperiled environment, new ways of living with the water, new ways and new foods. We're looking for uh, agroforestry where we are trying to create, you know, a food forest where trees that were not normally found together, we're putting them together to be able to have a source of food, still wanting to be self-sufficient and trying to hold on to, you know, our way of life. Because, you know, we've been here for thousands of years. and to just not try to, you know, to to preserve it. Uh, it's it's just not in us. And um, I'm looking forward to the questions. And thank you very much for allowing me to share. Thank you so much, Rosina. Uh, and as I said before, um, I hope you can bear with us for a few more minutes than our allotted hour uh, so that we can hear the questions. Uh, I do have a few questions here that folks have uh, already sent in. Uh, the first one that I have is, and I'm not sure who just uh, put this to, maybe Ryan or maybe Sister Wendy might have this answer. Uh, how many people will be displaced by sea level rise in the next five to 10 years? Perhaps we can Perhaps start. Ryan, now I'm muted. Um, uh, is that Sister is Wendy? That Sorry, that was Ryan. Okay, Ryan, go okay, ahead. Ryan, go ahead. Um, I didn't. I, I kind of lost the last part of what you said, but as far as the question is concerned, um, estimates that I've read uh, predict that sea level rise increases at a rate of about one inch per ten years. Um, so while I don't know the exact number of people who would be displaced by that one extra one inch, um, I believe the will of the Vetti brothers were right to point out that in addition to that sea level rise, it's the storms and king tides that will also very much affect the people in low-lying islands and areas such as in the Pacific Islands. And so there might not be a complete inundation of these areas. They certainly will not be habitable for at least a portion of the year, if not a significant amount of the year. And so, unfortunately, I don't know a specific number off the top of my head, but this is, but also a five to ten year time frame is not a very long time. And a lot of the sea level rise um, estimates that I've seen are are a little bit more um, concerning, a little bit further out into the future. Okay, thank you, Ryan. Um, uh, we're having echo unless the presenters unmute themselves or mute themselves. Um, I think that the question, though, can also be answered uh, by how many folks in these areas of high impact are already being resettled. Uh, so we've got folks in the South Pacific uh, area that resettlement is already occurring. And we also have areas in Louisiana where resettlement is going to occur. Um, I'm not sure of the numbers, but it is already happening. Uh, this question I'm thinking may go to Sister Wendy and the Livati brothers. 
uh, to describe the importance of palm trees for your local community. And I'm going to mute myself at this point. Uh, I think the Levetti brothers can speak to that one first. You there? Hi there, everyone. Okay. Um, so, with the importance of palm trees, so um, palm trees, more specifically, it's not within, I guess, not of them, um, not that important within our country. But I know within other islands, well, closer towards, I guess, Indonesia, um, palm trees have been a great, uh, have been a big source of substances for them, and. Um, such as, I guess, uh, they, they utilize palm trees for different resources, such as, um, uh, what else do they use them for? Such as oils, and they use them as, yeah, it's just um, different resources that they use the palm trees for. It's not specifically towards our country, but our country utilizes um, blocker and more food crops, but I, I think that that'll answer for the question. Um, Wendy, would you like to add anything onto that? Uh, yes, I mean, I, I mentioned earlier that, um, yeah, for example, coconut palms, uh, the, the leaves are used for multiple things, for baskets, for, for carrying things, including babies even, uh, and uh, for mats, for housing, for, for housing and for, for community gatherings. Uh, and mats that are also used as part of ceremonial exchanges, uh, and, and clo clothing, all kinds of wonderful decorative clothing for ceremonies and dancing and so on. So um, that's the thing about uh, you know all, all peoples living in in those specific cultures, uh, the ingenuity they have of using all the environmental. Um, uh, Parts of their uh, their lives, all the all the uh, resources in their environment, uh, for um, for multiple uses in their their daily lives. Well, thank you. Um, we have a question here for uh, Rosina. Uh, Rosina, the question has to do with resettlement uh, in the Gulf. Uh, is the community uh, happy with the resettlement plans that the government has? The government does not have a plan for resettlement that will embrace and um, ensure the integrity of the population, especially indigenous populations. And those, uh, a majority of our indigenous populations are, you know, the frontline communities on the coast. You know, they're, they're not taking into account our culture, our, our need for our, you know, to preserve, you know, our, our cultural practices and our heritage and what that means, you know, to the longevity of being indigenous, you know, persons. So, you know, the, the plan is just they move you away from, you know, the danger and just put you somewhere further away. They're not taking into account, you know, livelihood, economic needs of your community. Um, it's just moving. So um, the government does not have a plan because they're not fully invested in, you know, who we are as a people. And uh, I think first it has to be, a, you know, a, an understanding of the indigenous culture before, uh, you know, that can happen. And I don't see that happening at all. Right. Well, thank you. Um, at this point, allow me to give a special thanks to all our presenters, uh, to Ryan Ono, Sister Wendy Flannery, Livetti and Siloto Livetti, and Rosina Philippe. I also extend my thanks to all of you who joined us. Uh, for any more information, I'd ask you to please email me. I put my email up here on the slide. Uh, or you can visit our website as well to see resources and materials that we have. Uh, I bid you good night or good day for those of you uh, in Australia and in the Pacific Islands that are joining us. Uh, may you go in peace and seek climate justice for all of creation. Uh, good night and good day.
Thank you.